you for fellowship. We thank you for laughter and joy amongst the body and wonderful, wonderful, uh, delightful fellowship, Father, that uh, we spend this time speaking much of Christ, uh, Christ crucified, Christ risen and glorified, uh, that, Father, we might live. Uh, Father, we are so grateful for every opportunity. I pray that we, we take your word uh, this morning, that it would be not me, but, Father, uh, me serving as a channel only. Uh, Father, that your truth may go forth from this place, that all those teaching this morning, uh, that, Father, your word would be uh, penetrating to the heart, that, Father, those that, that do not know you, they would bow the knee at the cross where alone salvation is found, and that, Father, uh, we would grow on the meat of truth, the meat of your word, uh, Father, growing ever more each and every day. Uh, all these things we pray, your blessing over in Christ's name. Amen. Today we're in Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Uh, my goal today is to preach Christ. There are many who will step into a pulpit or teacher seat today and make no mention of Christ only tickle the ears of the attendees, make them feel much higher in position than they truly are. Uh, let me share a quote from Charles Spurgeon on this very topic. He, sweat, he said, Leave Christ out? Oh, my brethren, better leave the pulpit out altogether. If a man can preach one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last. Certainly the last that any Christian ought to go hear him preach. Charles Spurgeon, you ever want to hear somebody spit fire? <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, yeah, there'll, there'll be more of him this morning. This fall semester, we have endeavored to admonish you, saints of Christ here in Abilene, with encouragement and instruction from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. To recap quickly, we'll examine again the three points of the context of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, number two, Paul's meeting with the Ephesian elders, and then finally, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus that we know as the book of Ephesians. After that, we'll look uh, back at what God is teaching the saints in the letter up to where we are today in concluding Ephesians chapter 4. So, as a quick reminder, there's an agreement among scholars that this document was penned between 60 and 62 AD, so roughly 30 years into the church's existence. At that stage, Paul had been journeying as a missionary, teaching in many regions, including Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia at that time. The letter of Ephesians is referred to as a prison epistle. You'll never guess why, since it was penned to the Ephesian church during Paul's Roman imprisonment. This was likely to have been about five years after his last engagement with believers in the Ephesian assembly, uh, which we have an account of in Acts chapter 20. So this brings us to context points number one and two. So Acts 20 chapter 17 through 38. This is what is believed to be the last encounter Paul had with those believers in Ephesus before penning the book of Ephesians. So uh, we'll see uh, chapter 20, verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia. Time out. Let's back up. Back up the truck. What's Paul referring to? His time in Asia. All right. Acts chapter 19. Let's flip back a page or two. We have some context. Point number one here of Paul's time spent in Ephesus, which he'll be referring to in chapter 20. Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, Paul in Ephesus. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some began stubborn, 
uh, became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Verse 11, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded, And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them. And found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. We're able to see here the beginning of Paul's relationship with the Christians in Ephesus. He stayed for a period longer than two years in order that every Jew and Greek in the region heard the message of Christ. Such a fantastic work was being done here that the pagan religious practices of magic and mysticism were totally done away with to the tune of financial loss, 50,000 pieces of silver worth. This is often a point associated with following Christ, financial hardship, giving up of those things. So now that we see a picture of what his ministry began with in Ephesus, let's come to the letter, him, uh, him interacting with the elders before he pins the, uh, the book of Ephesians to them later. So Acts chapter 20. Now from Miletus, beginning in verse 17, he sent from Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day I set foot in Asia. So now we have context. We know the ministry and what happened. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, verse 22, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me and every city that imprisonment and affections, afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace and of God. Verse 25, And now, behold, I know that none of you, uh, none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. Verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. 
You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Verse 36, and we, when he had said these things, Paul, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Observe here the affections that the Ephesian elders had for Paul, the relationship that existed among these believers, and how much they longed for fellowship and grieved the thought of not having another occasion to fellowship again. In Acts chapter 21, 15 through 36, we see that Paul heads to Jerusalem, just like he said, uh, on his third missionary journey and is arrested in the temple, likely as a result of his relationships with Ephesians already established at this point, which we'll see in just a moment. Beginning in verse 15, after these, these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When he had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. Jump ahead to verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Verse 29, for they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and all the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. Paul was, uh, after this, he was eventually shipwrecked in, uh, as a transported prisoner on the island of Malta, an island 17 miles long and 9 miles wide, about 60 miles south of Sicily. The location of the shipwreck is actually known today as St. Paul's Bay. After healing the island leader's father, they were equipped with everything they needed to continue their journey safely and set sail again roughly three months later, to eventually end up in Rome. Paul's gentleness and incredible witness toward others during this transport could be what attributed to his treatment upon arriving in Rome. We often picture Paul writing letters in cold, dank, dark, wet jail cells on the floor, neighbored by rats. Okay? However, we get a glimpse of his Roman imprisonment in Acts 28, verse 16, which uh, says, And when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Still likely chained, as we read in Ephesians 6.20, a mention of chains, Paul had the freedom to write and defend his case from his lodgings in Rome. We see that in Acts 28.23, where many come to his abode, his lodgings, where he is defending his case. So our context has been laid out. We see, number one, the great works the Lord accomplished through Paul while he was, uh, brought the gospel message of Christ to Ephesus. Number two, we saw the relationship and great affections Paul and the Ephesian Christians had toward one another. And number three, we see the state in which Paul was penning this letter to those he loved and longed to see grow in their new life in Christ. In establishing this context, let's catch up on a few treasures God has unearthed for us from the book of Ephesians over the past semester. As you may recall, Ephesians is broken up into two key sections. The first three chapters are theological, uh, emphasizing New Testament doctrine, whereas the last three chapters are practical and focus on Christian behavior. This is where we are. However, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we have the thesis of this letter. Verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things on heaven and things on earth. Warren Wearsby speaks these words on verses 9 and 10. 
this letter has much to say about God's plan for his people, a plan that was not fully understood even in Paul's day. The word mystery has nothing to do with things eerie. Uh, It means a sacred secret, once hidden but now revealed to God's people. We believers are a part of God's inner circle, so to speak. We are able to share in the secret that God will one day unite everything in Christ. Ever since sin came into the world, things have been falling apart. First, man was separated from God, Genesis 3 in the fall. Then man was separated from man, as Cain killed Abel in chapter 4. Then people tried to maintain a kind of unity by building the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. But God judged them and scattered them across the world. God called Abraham and put difference between the Jew and the Gentile, a difference that was maintained until Christ's death on the cross. Sin is tearing everything apart, but in Christ... God will gather everything together in the culmination of the ages. We are a part of this great eternal program. All God's people said, amen. Eric Redmond adds, uh, this planned togetherness of Jews and Gentiles in the church was not clearly revealed prior uh, to Paul and his fellow apostles. Uh, Hence, God calls it a mystery, meaning the secret previously hidden but now revealed. So, How do we see this great consummation begin to work? How do we see some of this mystery revealed? In previous weeks, we've had the pleasure of teachers uh, sharing with us on how the Christian was once dead but now alive, Ephesians 2, 3 through 7. How those separated, those of the circumcision and those outside, Jews and Gentiles, are brought into one new man, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. And how we are to walk in this unity as we read in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. One body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This brings us to our passage for today in Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. We read it beginning in verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. What word does this passage begin with in verse 25? If you have spent any length of time at Southside, you won't be surprised to hear that the first thing we need to do with this passage is backtrack to the first word, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Let's read back to last week's passage on the new man, verses 17 through 24. Verse 17, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Verse 19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Our passage today operates 
as instruction based on the fact that the Christian, the new man, is opposite of the former, the old man, one previously walking as the Gentiles did. New creatures act like new creatures. One of my absolute favorite examples of the new man is a story told uh, uh, from the life of Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo. Charles Spurgeon can tell it better than I ever could, so I'll quote him. It, it's lengthy, but it is truly weighty. Um, I, I don't know. I, I always wonder what, what he sounded like. If you haven't seen a picture of Spurgeon, big beard, big belly, just, just a, you know, I, so I imagine he has a deeper voice. Uh, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> Bless you. This was the teaching of our baptism. When we were baptized, we were buried in the water. The teaching was that we were henceforth to be dead and buried to the world and alive alone for Jesus. It was the crossing of the Rubicon the drawing of the sword, and the flinging away of the scabbard. If the world should call us, we now reply, we are dead to thee, O world. One of the early saints, I think it was Augustine, had uh, indulged in great sins in his younger days. After his conversion, he met with a woman who had been the sharer of his wicked follies. She approached him winningly and said to him, Augustine, but he ran away from her with all speed. She called after him, Augustine, it is I, mentioning her name. But he then turned around and said, but it is not I. The old Augustine is dead, and I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. That to Madam Bubble and Madam Wonton, to the world, the flesh, and the devil should be the answer of every true servant of Christ. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Thou art the same, O fair false world. Thou art the same, but not I. I have passed from death unto life, from darkness into light. Thy siren charms can fascinate me no more. A nobler music is in my ear, and I am drawn forward by a more sovereign spell towards others than yours. My bark shall cut her way through all seas and waves till it reaches the fair heaven, the fair haven I see my Savior face to face. Tis irretrievable then, this step which we have taken, the absolute surrender of our whole nature to the sway of the Prince of Peace. We are the Lord's. We are His forever and forever. We cannot draw back, and blessed be His name. His grace will not suffer us to do so. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. How can we know that one among us is indeed of Christ? Examine them. Do they walk in the ways of the world, loving what is evil, calling evil good, and displaying no love for the things of the Lord? Or do do they look at the world and say, talk to the hand because the Christian don't want to hear it. Jesus taught in Matthew 7 that we examine them by their behavior. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will receive them by their fruits. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear good fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Uh, Bad, good, there we go. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. We recognize a new creation in Christ by their fruit. We observe their all-encompassing behaviors, not just how they behave when they attend a gathering of the assembly on Sunday mornings. How do they speak? Are they providing for themselves? Are they holding a grudge? Or do they have a spirit of forgiveness that permeates their life? 1 John 2, 4 states, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So, because we are Christians, put on the new self, We as Christians put on the new self and are called to live as the new creations we are in Christ. 
Paul moves us here and now in Ephesians uh, 4.25, Paul moves us into practical application. He names five sins to avoid and why. More so with each of these practical commands of Christian living, he continues to work from a twofold perspective, addressing the negative, the former ways of the old man, and the positive, the way of Christ and the new man. We begin with lying. Put away falsehood, verse 25. The Greek word used here uh, to address the removal of any non-truth is also found in Acts 7.58. It is the word Luke used of the Jewish leaders who, as they were stoning Stephen, they laid aside their robes at the feet of the young man named Saul. We can see this language holds true to the picture of taking off and putting on. Contrasting, Paul follows by quoting Zechariah 8.16. These are the things that you shall do. Speak the truth to one another. Render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. In John 14.6, we hear that the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. In John 14, 17, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. And in John 17, 17, Jesus prays to the Father that his children would be sanctified in truth for, quote, thy word is truth. We now serve a God of truth and must, as genuine believers, forsake any falsehood. Any form of lying is absolutely contradictory to the newness of life in Christ. When should we speak truth? Always. But especially with our brothers and sisters in Christendom. We see this in the back half of verse 25. Speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. The word neighbor is defined by this phrase. Since we're speaking of the body, imagine for a moment what happens when nerve endings no longer speak truth to the rest of our body. What happens to the child who places their hands on the hot stove, yet nerve endings never send a signal to the brain saying, hot, hot, hot? Speak the truth always, but ever so much more uh, is the importance of speaking truth with the body of Christ. Second, uh, the second sin addresses anger. Be angry and yet do not sin. Paul quotes from Psalm 4.4, be angry or tremble, or agitated, and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds, and be silent, Selah. How do we understand this instruction? Growing up, I always thought, uh, as a whole, anger was sinful. We see, however, that anger in and of itself is neither positive nor negative from a sin perspective. And looking at the word used in the Hebrew for anger in Psalm 4.4, it has many renderings, but with the main root, to quiver. It can be translated, be afraid, stand in awe, disquiet, fall out, fret, move, provoke, quake, rage, shake, tremble, trouble, or my favorite, be wroth. That that word starts with a W. The Greek word used in Ephesians 4.26 is a word uh, that doesn't mean momentary outward boiling over rage or inward seething resentment but rather a deep-seated, determined, and settled conviction. What makes this emotion good or bad is the motive. Do you hate your boss because they gave someone else a raise while you've been stuck at so many dollars an hour for the past three years? Or do you hate the grievous evils being done even today to God's children all over the world? Do you hate the lies of false religions? and Satan's use thereof in ensnaring family and friends that we ever prayerfully endeavor to see released and bowing the knee at the cross of Christ. It comes back to the concept of loving what God loves and hating what God hates. However, long before John Piper and his concept coined uh, Christian hedonism, Jonathan Edwards provided these words in a book, The Religious Affections. In speaking on the boldness of the Christian, he says, quote, Zeal is the fervor of this flame as it ardently and vigorously goes out towards the good that is its object. And so, consequentially, in the opposite, 
to the evil that is contrary to it and impedes it. There is indeed opposition and vigorous opposition. That is a part of it, or rather as an attendant of it. But it is against things and not persons. Bitterness against the persons of men is no part of it, but is very contrary to it. Insomuch that so much the warmer true zeal is and the higher it is raised, so much the further are persons from such bitterness and so much fuller the love both to the evil and to the good. It is no other in its very nature and essence the fervor of Christian love. Let any stirring up of your spirit align with Christian zeal and love of Christ and his children, not any anger and selfishness or hard-heartedness toward another. Beyond this, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Even righteous anger, if allowed to stand for long periods, can sour and turn into a bitter desire for vengeance. This is an opportunity for Satan to feed our anger with pride, self-righteousness, and the like. Be stirred up with your Christian zeal. Uh, pray God's will in overcoming the evils of this world that is passing away and let it go. Verse 28, we look at stealing. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Whoop, whoop, work, work. Doing honest work with his own hands so that we may have something to share with anyone in need. What's interesting here is that we would expect Paul to say something to the effect of don't steal, instead work so that you provide for your own household and don't burden another. Even honest labor becomes a selfish thing. And this Paul seeks to avoid. Rather, he sets a much higher bar than this, emphasizing that the Christian is, of course, one who provides for his own, uh, his own needs, his own household, but goes beyond that to working in such a capacity that we are able to even help others. Instead of stealing, be a worker and share with those in need. According to Warren Wearsby, uh, quote, Of course, Paul was not writing to believers who could not work because of handicaps, but with those who would not work. It was not only slaves, but citizens who were addicted to thievery. For Paul wrote to people in the Ephesian church who were gainfully employed. Consider his second letter to the church in Thessalonica, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 and 11. If anyone would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, we read that the Christian who does not work and, quote, provide for his own and especially for those in his own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. To claim Christ and embrace laziness is in no way the life of the new creation. The old man loves idleness and the food of others' labor. The new man has a spirit of labor, provides for his own household, and produces enough for sharing. Verse 29, we look at corrupt speech. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. What's important to consider here is that the mouth and the heart are connected. Matthew 12, 34 says that out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Romans 3, 14 states that the sinner's mouth is, quote, full of cursing and bitterness. A change of the heart is necessarily, uh, has, uh, let's see, a change of the heart necessarily has a changed mouth that follows. The word used for corrupt, for corrupt speech here, is also used in Matthew 7, 17 through 18. Interestingly enough, we've already miss it, mentioned this passage, a rotten tree bears rotten, corrupt fruit. It is rotten words. Consider also the words of Colossians 3, 8 through 11, how they compare with our passage today. Verse 8, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. 
the Christian knows that their life is a living testimony to the workmanship of a holy, sovereign God. Their words matter. The appetite of the old life hungered for gossip, crude joking, perverse comments, and the like. Instead, the new man knows in whose name he or she stands. As Christian, little Christ, our aim is to make much of him and the glorious works of his hands renewing us daily. Colossians 4.6 or or, excuse me, uh, the remedy is to make sure that the heart is full of blessing. So fill the heart with the love of Christ so that only truth and purity can come out of the mouth. Paul told us to put the salt of God's grace in everything we say in Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Next, we have bitterness in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Bitterness refers to the settled hostility that poisons the whole inner man. This is when someone does something we do not like, so we harbor ill will toward them. Colossians 3.19 uses this same word. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter against them. We have seen opposites position against each other throughout this whole passage. Instead of falsehoods, speak truth. Instead of sinful, uncontrollable anger, exercise righteous anger, which you don't let consume you to another day. Instead of stealing, work heartily and even share with those in need. Instead of corrupt, filthy speech, give a word good for building up in each moment. The opposite of putting away bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and malice we see in verse 30, grieving the Holy Spirit. Jesus uses this word for grieving in John 21, 17. Quote, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? Remember, he's asked three times. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Charles Spurgeon preached on this topic in the Royal Surrey Gardens in 1859 and had the following remarks. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It does not say, do not make him angry. A more delicate and tender term is used, grieve him not. For grief is a sweet combination of anger and of love. When I commit any offense, some friend who hath but little patience suddenly snaps asunder his forbearance and is angry with me. The same offense is observed by a loving father, and he is grieved. Thus, I hear the Holy Spirit speaking to himself, I love this man. I want to have his heart, and yet he is entertaining these filthy lusts. His thoughts, instead of running after me and after Christ and after the Father, are running after the temptations that are in the world through lust. I think I see the Spirit of God grieving. When you are sitting down to read a novel, and there is your Bible unread. Perhaps you take, take down some book on travels and you forget that you've got a more precious book of travels in the Acts of the Apostles and in the story of your blessed Lord and Master. You have not time for prayer, but the Spirit sees you very active about worldly things and having many hours for relaxation and amusement. And then he is grieved because he sees you love worldly things better than you love him. Let me be clear, we do not lose our salvation because of our sinful attitudes, but we certainly lose the joy of our salvation and the fullness of the Spirit's blessing. Lastly, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We are to be a forgiving people made up of forgiven people. While we were still sinners, God forgave us. 
In conclusion, because you're new, Believers are to change from lying to speaking the truth, from unrighteous anger to righteous anger, from stealing to sharing, from unwholesome words to edifying words, and from natural vices to supernatural virtues. You are in Christ, and His Holy Spirit lives within you, ever desiring to see you made more and more like Christ each day. Be the new creation you are. Do not return to the closet and put on something that should remain put aside and cause the grief of a loving and gracious God. Why? Because you're new. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you ever so much more each and every day for how wonderful you are, how gracious you are to us, how, uh, Father, in your loving forbearance, you know you called us unto you knowing full well that the only thing that we bring to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. Father, I pray that uh, your word from this morning penetrates our hearts, spurs us along to a life of good works, uh, good works edifying toward those around us, that for the remainder of this Lord's day, we seek to exercise the giftedness that you bestowed upon each and every one of your children for the building up of the body so that your name would be great and made much of and us less. Father, glory unto you and your name forever and ever. Come, Lord Jesus, in Christ's name I pray. Amen.